Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air, but first, the daily contemplation. Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha, consummated in knowledge and behavior, totally transcended, expert in all dimensions, knower of all worlds, unsurpassable trainer of those who can be tamed, both teacher and guide of gods as well as of humans, blessed, exalted, awakened, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha. Perfectly formulated is this Buddha Dhamma, visible right here and now, immediately effective, timeless, inviting each and every one to come and see for themselves, inspect, examine, and verify, leading each and every one through progress towards perfection, directly observable, experienceable, and realizable by each intelligence, perfectly training is this noble Sangha community of the Buddha's noble disciples. They are training the right way, the true way, the good way, the direct way. Therefore, to these eight kind of individuals, these four noble pairs deserve both gifts self-sacrifice, offerings, hospitality, and reverence or salutation, the joint palms. Since this noble Sangha community of the Buddhist noble disciples is an unsurpassable and in, indeed forever unsurpassed field of merit in this world, for this world, to honor, respect, support, uphold, and protect. Thank you. Hello to you friends, this is Dhamma on air number 46. Uh, recorded outside in what looks to be an uh, upcoming rainstorm. Uh, so we'll do it quickly. There are three questions. Uh, but first, the normal intro. The questions all uh, circle around uh, suicide and what the Buddha said about suicide and suicide in his time around the monks. But first, the normal intro. Namo. Tasso. Bhagavato. Arahato, Samma Sambuddhasa, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened, was the blessed Buddha. The first question goes like this Which future destinies are possible for one person who commits suicide? And uh, the fact that he's committed suicide or she's committed suicide doesn't alter itself uh, the destiny because the destiny is determined by the coming accumulation uh, that is lying before the moment of suicide. So uh, the, in the death moment, the duty moment is determined by the mental constituents, the mental properties, whether they are heat, greed, hate or fear or panic present in the very last moment. 
that will determine the destiny is up or down and it's which qualities right after the death moment. So it's not determined by the mode of death itself, whether it's traffic accident, suicide, uh, uh, murder or whatever. It's determined by what mental state the person has in the very last moment of their life, which is again conditioned and determined by all the prior moments they have in their life and what they did in these moments. If they were serial killers, then they cannot find peace here. If they were very good givers, then they can find peace here. Whether they are in a suicide or not, a traffic accident or not, they can't find peace in their penultimate moment. So the destiny is not determined by the death mode itself. I hope this is clear. So it's a karmic accumulation from the distant past up to the very moment of death, by suicide or not, that de de determines the destination. This was question 151. Question 152. Does a person who commits suicide break the first precept of uh, no killing? Yes, they do. But that is a special situation because uh, no killing means all beings, including oneself. And it's particularly uh, forbidden by the Buddha to uh, say to other beings that they should commit suicide. This is, if we do this as monk, then we are finished as monk. It's parajika uh, offense. It's the worst offense, one of the four, four, four worst offenses we can do is to recommend suicide to another being. This is not allowed at all. Then you're out, you're finished, you have to disrobe, whether known or unknown. If you have done that, you're not a monk anymore. But however, there was three monks at the Buddha's time that was enlightened just before they died. And when he came up and saw their corpse, then he knows three cases. And I'll read aloud uh, the text for you. He pronounced that their suicide was blameless, despite they have committed suicide. Then their suicide was blameless. Why was that so? Because they were enlightened at the moment of death. So they didn't get a new body, didn't get a new life with more suffering. They had to done what should be done. Uh, so when they use a knife, it's a moment, of, it's a saying of, of suicide in the, in, the, in the text because you usually use the knife you use for razoring, either to slit your throat or to slit your veins in both hands. And then you'll bleed out and die from uh, bleeding. Use the knife is the same. And these three cases uh, I'll read out is so Godiga, Channa and Vakali uh, that committed suicide uh, and Buddha came and saw it, was informed about it, came and saw it and pronounced that their suicide was blameless. Why so? Because they were enlightened. Bodhi at the death moment. No more to do. In all other cases, he would say, since uh, they had more to do here while in the human state, then it's, it is not blameless. It is blameful to commit suicide. And this goes on to the next question. There's also, I will also say one poem about Zapadasa, who considered committing suicide, but didn't do it, and made a very nice poem about it when he became enlightened on later on. We'll go inside and uh, read out this text because the uh, rainstorm is coming here heavily. What did the Buddha say about his views and knowledge about suicide? Yes, he said basically this. If the person is enlightened, then it's blameless. But if the person is not enlightened, and that's the case for almost all suicides we know uh, in the world today, I say all of them, then it is blameful. Why so? Because it basically doesn't fulfill the premise of the suicide. The supposition or the assumption of the suicide is that the suicidal person thinks, ah, now I will be freed of suffering. But that's not the case. That's not the case. Actually, the suffering becomes much worse by committing suicide. Why so? Because you're usually born in a body Imagine a, a, a drug addiction person who takes an overdose or one who hangs himself after being, being a pedophile 
or uh, have done other evil things, usually these evil things will propel them into a destiny that is much worse than the human being. And there they will have very much less chance to deal with these problems and to do something good to take them out of this suicidal mental mood that is brought on by bad morality, by transgression of ethics, repeatedly over a long period of time. Stealing, drinking, cheating, so on. Then suddenly, all this stacking up of all these immoral acts, which one knows very well is wrong, this makes the mind disgusted with itself. It makes self-contempt. And then, during a long period of after a long period of depression, it will cease try to uh, cease an ending of this suffering by possibly ending its own life. But since there is reincarnation, since there is rebirth, this suffering starts right at the other side of the suicide, and much worse than before. Either at the animal stage, the angry demon stage. The hungry ghost states, if there's been cheating or uh, misappropriation of marriage, or in the hell state in most cases. So they go from a human state to the hell state, uh, thinking that the suicide will save them from the consequences of their bad actions they have performed. If, for example, drug addicts, uh, heroin addicts, or whoever, they have been stealing or cheating or murdering other people for valuables uh, to get uh, drugs and so on, can also be uh, dictators, uh, politicians that has, have uh, drug patrols and s killing patrols and so on. It can be many issues, economical issues also, stealing, misappropriation of value, insurance fraud, tax fraud, uh, all kinds of things. Having sex with your friends, uh, wife, while she was pregnant for the first time, or whatever, can be many things, many things. Over a long period of time, not only in this life, but also in prior lives, there can be hangovers of these immoral acts, then then suddenly propel the individual to think that it's most rational to kill itself. And that's what the Buddha say, that's not the case. Because the whole assumption that right after the suicide, then there will be peace, no suffering, that's wrong. The suicide doesn't end suffering if it only were so easy. The suicide enhances suffering that already have been constructed from karmic causes all the way up to the suicide. And they are not wiped out by suicide. They cannot be wiped out. It, they are like a probabilistic shadow that follow any individual wherever they go. Wherever they reappear here on this side, usually lower than human, then they will have to experience the consequences uh, of their bad karma they have performed in the past. So that's basically why it's crazy to commit suicide. Because the assumption of suicide is that it will reduce or end suffering. While the fact is, in almost all cases, except the enlightened cases, that the suffering right after suicide goes sky high. Barbecue, huh? barbecue screaming. So that's not the end of suffering. That's the beginning of a new suffering that could have been dealt with if the suicidal person has waited and say, okay, can I find another solution? Is there another solution? And yes, there is another solution as to admit to oneself that one have done wrong, trying to repair it, and then do a lot of good. Then one will come out of this suicidal, very depressed, closed syndrome of depression. I have uh, uh, made two videos, one recent, about how to cure depression using meditation on universal friendliness. And I'll give the link below right here. So much uh, for the questions today uh, on suicide. Now I'll go indoor and then we'll uh, take the text on the three monks that committed blameless suicide and the one monk who didn't commit suicide.
but became enlightened and looked back and made a very nice poem about it. Yes, then here follows the three reports about the three monks that blamelessly committed suicide because they were already enlightened at the Buddhist time. And it's, uh, first one is about Channa. It's not the Channa that was uh, a Buddhist driver uh, at, at when he left the, his uh, castle. It's another Channa. We don't know much about him. Uh, the next one is uh, Godiga Tera. He was a, a fairly rich guy from Prava, and he went forth when he saw the Buddha, and Bimbisara uh, promised to build a hut to him, but forgot to build the uh, King Bimbisara, to, forgot to build the roof. But uh, Godiga, he, he didn't complain about that. Later on, uh, he tried to attain enlightenment and was very close six times, but uh, didn't succeed. And this was the reason for his uh, suicide. Channa committed suicide because he was very, very, very ill, as we will hear, where he has pain in, in his, his entire body. Uh, and the last one is Vakali. And then there's one called Sapadasa who didn't do it. But uh, I read out loud so you can realize what these people, why these people did it. It was not at all because they were depressed at all. Uh, it was because they have done what should be done, uh, but still they could not attain enlightenment. And because they were bothered either in body or in mind by this fact that they were very close, uh, but could not open the door. So here we go. The first one is Channa Sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya, which you see a picture of here. Majjhima Nikaya, the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, and it's number 144, Advice to Channa. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha, in the bamboo groove, you see here, in the squirrel sanctuary. There's still squirrels there. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Mahakunda, and the Venerable Channa were living on the mountain Vulture's Peak, which you see here, where the Buddha also stayed many times. On that occasion, the Venerable Channa was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. Then, when it was in the evening, the Venerable Sariputta rose from meditation and went to the Venerable Mahakunda and said to him, Friend Kunda, let us go to the Venerable Channa and ask about his illness. Then they went up the mountain, far, far away, 10 kilometers. Yes, friend, the Venerable Mahakunda replied. Then the Venerable Saputta and the Venerable Mahakunda went to the Venerable Channa and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down to one side, and the Venerable Sariputta said to the Venerable Channa, I hope you are getting well. Friend Channa, I hope you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing. And their subsiding, not their increase, is apparent. Channa then replies, Friend Sariputta, I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. The increasing and, and not the subsiding is apparent. I shall use the knife, Friend Sariputta. I have no desire to live. Sariputta then answers, Let the Venerable Chanda not use the knife. Then Let the Venerable Chanda live. We want the Venerable Chanda to live. If he lacks suitable food, I will go in search of suitable food for him. If he lacks suitable medicine, I will go in search of suitable medicine. If he lacks a proper attendant, I will attend on him. Let the Venerable Chanda not use the knife. Let the Venerable Chanda live. We want the Venerable Channa to live, said Sariputta. Thereby, Channa, he responds, he's fairly realistic here, dry. Friend Sariputta, it is not that I have no suitable food or medicine or no proper attendant, but rather, friend Sariputta, the teacher has long been worshipped by me with love, not without love. For it is proper for the disciple to worship the teacher with love, not without love. Friend Sariputta, remember this, the Bhikkhu Channa will use the knife, blamelessly.
so upset about the ask. We would ask Venerable Channa certain questions. If the Venerable Channa finds it opportunity to, to reply, that would be nice. Ask friend Sariputta, says Channa. When I have heard, I shall know. Friend Channa, do you regard the I, I consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind or through the I consciousness? Thus, this I have seen, this is mine. This I am, this is myself. Do you regard the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, mind consciousness, and things cognizable through mind consciousness? Thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Jenna then replies, Friend Sariputta, I regard the I, I consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through I consciousness. Thus, this is not mine. This, this I am not. This is not myself. I regard the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, mind consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness. Thus, this is not mine. This is not what I am. This I am not. This is not myself. Frenchania, when you have seen what you have directly known in the eye, in the eye consciousness, and in things cognizable by the mind through eye consciousness, that you regard them thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. What have you seen? What have you directly known in the ear, in the nose, in the tongue, in the body, in the mind, in the mind consciousness? in the things cognizable by the mind, through mind consciousness, that you regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Chana then replies, Friend Sariputta, it is through seeing cessation, stilling, ceasing, through directly knowing cessation in the eye, in the eye consciousness, and in things cognizable by the mind through eye consciousness, that I regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. It is through seeing cessation that they come and go, that this eye consciousness and nose consciousness and mental consciousness and tactile come and go. He sees them go also. How can they then be his if they go by themselves? It is through seeing cessation, through directly knowing cessation in the ear, in the nose, in the tongue, in the body, in the mind, in the mind consciousness, and in things cognizable by the mind, through mind consciousness, that I regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When this was said, the Venerable Mahakunda said to Venerable Channa, Therefore, friend Channa, this instruction of the Blessed One is to be constantly given attention. There is wavering in one who is dependent. There is no wavering in one who is independent. When there is no wavering, there is tranquility. When there is tranquility, there is no bias. When there is no bias, there is no coming and going. When there is no coming and going, there is no passing away and reappearing. When there's no passing away and reappearing, then there's no here, no beyond, no in between. This, only this, is the end of suffering. Then the Venerable Sai Buddha and the Venerable Mahakunta had advised the Venerable Chana thus, they rose from their seats and went away. Then soon after they have gone, the Venerable Channa used the knife. Then the Venerable Santa, Sariputta went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down to one side and said to the Blessed Buddha, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Channa has used the knife. What is his destination? What is his future course? Then Buddha looks at Sariputta and says, Sariputta, didn't the Bhikkhu Channa declare to you his blamelessness? Venerable Sir, there is a variant village called 
Papa Chara. There the Venerable Channa had families. There he has friends and intimates, families that were blameworthy. So Sariputta here implies that Channa had said this because he thought his family line was pure seven generations back. And thereby, because his family line was pure, he was blameless. But then Buddha responds to him. There are those families that are friends of and Bhikkhu, of Bhikkhu Channa Sariputta, family that was his intimates, family that were blameworthy. But I do not say that to this extent he was blameworthy. Sariputta, when one lays down this body and clings to a new body, then I say one is blameworthy. There was none of that in Bhikkhu Channa. The Bhikkhu Channa used the knife blamelessly. That is what the Blessed Buddha said. The Venerable Sariputta was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So much for Channa. Uh, now we go. Uh, it's, so a blameless suicide because he didn't get a new body. He had no rebirth, no reincarnation. Suffering didn't start right on the other side of his rebirth because there was no rebirth. He has attained the end of suffering already before. And this he declared to Sariputta, which had doubt that this was the case. Now we take a uh, Gudika. Gudika was, had been king for seven times in a row for gifts to prior Buddhas. And now he also made a Buddha, Buddha Gautama. And right there and then, even though he was fairly wealthy and senior, uh, decided to ordain. And then King Bimbisara, which was the same age as the Buddha, he promised to build a hut to him. And he also built a hut and uh, when Gudika uh, moved in, but uh, then the king forget to build the, the roof. Then Venerable Gudiga, he stayed in there uh, until the, the roof was on. He didn't say anything. So that's an example. They don't make any complaints. If you don't fulfill your promise to them, then they, they won't come and knock the door and say, hey, you, you forgot to build the roof. You, you gave a kuti, you gave a bhavana kuti, but you didn't build the roof. Why is that? They don't do that. They just stay there. Even so more embarrassing was it for Kim Bimbisara when people told him that Gudika was staying in his, in his gift, gifted uh, meditation hut without a roof. And he was a king. Why he hadn't arranged that this roof was built? This is, however, much later. Uh, and when Gudika, he comes very, very close to touching Nibbana, Nirodhi Samabhati, very close, six times. But then he fell away, fell away again. So he cannot, so to speak, this phase transition of consciousness, which has a threshold. He, he comes up to the threshold, but he cannot cross the threshold. He cannot come to the other side and make the irreversible phase transition of consciousness into enlightenment. And this frustrates him, of course. He tries six times. He, he, he touches it, but then he loses it in the, in the last minute. This is from the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha, which you see a picture of here. Gudika. Thus have I heard, on one question, the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagaha in the bamboo groove, in the squirrel sanctuary, which you see here. Still the squirrel sanctuary. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Gudika was dwelling at the Brackock at Isigili slope. Then while the Venerable Gudika was dwelling, diligent, ardent, and resolute, he reached temporary liberation of mind. But then he fell away from this temporary liberation of mind. A second time when Venerable Gudika was dwelling, diligent, ardent, and resolute, he reached temporary liberation of mind but then fell away from that temporary liberation of mind. 
a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time. While Venerable Godiga was drilling, diligent, ardent and resolute, he reached temporary release of mind. But then he fell away from that temporary liberation of mind. A seventh time, while the Venerable Godiga was dwelling diligent, ardent and resolute, he reached temporary release of mind. Then it occurred to Venerable Godiga, six times already have I fallen away from this temporary liberation of mind. Let me use the knife. Then Mara, the evil one, having known with his own mind the reflection of the Venerable Godiga's mind, he read his mind from far away, approached the blessed one, addressed him in with these verses. Why does Mara, the evil one, Satan, why does he not want this Buddhist monk to commit suicide? It is because he knows he will attain arahatship at the moment of this suicide. And this, he, he, he won't let it occur. And also he knows it will be reported as I report it right now to you. So he says to himself, if I say, don't use a knife, I, I Mara, then he, he won't listen to me. But if the Buddha says to him, don't use a knife, and thereby prevent him be from becoming an Arahat, prevent him from enlightenment, then he will listen to the Buddha. So therefore he goes to the Buddha and kind of in simile, uh, faking it, faking it that he has concern for Vinabha. Uh, Godika. And that shows us how treacherous, uh, but also intelligent Mara is. Here he shows, uh, I'm a nice guy. Can't you do like this and that? Blah, blah, blah. But he's not a nice guy. He has no, his own political motives. Ultra hedonism. Nevertheless, then Mara, the evil one, having known with his own mind the reflection of the Venerable Godika's mind, approached the blessed one and addressed him with these verses. O oh, great hero, great in wisdom, smoothing, huh? blazing forth with power and glory, I worship your feet, one with vision, who has overcome all enmity and fear. O oh, great hero who has vanquished death, your disciple is longing for death, he intends to take his own life. Restrain him from this, O luminous one. How, O blessed one, can your disciple, one delighting in the Dhamma, a trainee seeking his own mind's ideal, take his own life, even though he's widely famed? How can this be? Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Kutika has just used a knife. So, Mara comes too late to the Buddha. Then the blessed one have understood, ah, this is Mara, the evil one. He, he sees him, ah, this is not a Deva, this is not a divine being, this is Mara. Even though he's camouflaged as a divine being. Then the blessed one having understood, this is Mara, the evil one, addressed him in verse. Such one indeed is how the steadfast act. They are not attached to life. Having drawn out craving with its root, Gudika has attained final Nibbana. Then the blessed one addressed the bhikkhus to us. Come bhikkhus, let us go to the black rut on the Isigili slope, where the clansman Gudika has used the knife. Yes, whenever, sir, those bhikkhus replied. Then the Blessed one, together with a number of bhikkhus, went to the black rock on the Isigili slope. There the blessed one saw in the distance, distance that the Venerable Gandhika was lying on his bed with his shoulder turned. When you shall sleep as a monk, you should sleep with the right shoulder upwards. So, in the lion's position. No, you should lie on the right shoulder with the left shoulder upwards, in the lion's position. Knee against knee, ankle against ankle. Uh, with your right hand under your uh, head here and the other hand below on the hip. And that is to prevent uh, masturbation at night uh, on, during erotic dreams. It's also said that those who, who, who sleep on the left side, they have, still have greed. By those who sleep on the right side, in the lion's side, they, they don't have uh, greed. 
while those who sleep flat on the black snoring, they are dominated by ignorance. So you can evaluate your own mode of sleeping. Right side, left side, or on the back, snoring. Now, on that occasion when he saw this uh, lying with his shoulder turned, he saw a cloud of smoke, a swirl of darkness that was moving to the east, then to the west, then to the north, then to the south, then upwards, then downwards, and then to the intermediate quarters. And then the Blessed One addressed the Bikusos. Do you see, Bikus, this cloud of smoke, this swirl of darkness moving to the east, then to the west, to the north, to the south, upwards, downwards, and all in between? Yes, Venerable Sir. That because is Mara, the evil one, searching for the consciousness of the clansman Godika, wondering, where now has the consciousness of clansman Godika been established? However, Bikus, with consciousness unestablished, the clansman Godika has attained fire, Nibbana, Niruda Samabhati. Then Mara, the evil one, Taking a lute of yellow wilbur wood, approached the blessed one and addressed him in words. Above, below, and across, in the four quarters and in between, I have searching but not find anything about where Godika has gone. The Buddha then answered, The steadfast man fast the steadfast man was resolute, a meditator, always rejoicing in meditation, applying himself day and night without attachment even to life, having conquered the army of death, not returning to renewed existence, having drawn out craving with its root, Gudika has attained final Nibbana, Nibbana and Upatisesa, Nibbana without trace or remnants of clinging left. An Upatisesa, Nibbana, An Upatisesa. There's two Nibbanas, Nibbanas in this life, and Nibbana, the final Nibbana. This is the final Nibbana. Go to my website, search the two Nibbanas. What would have said? That net, the link is here. So much was he stricken with sorrow that his looped, loot dropped from his armpit. Thereupon this disappointed spirit disappeared right on the spot. So Mara, the evil one, Satan, who had a loot under his arm, he, he lost his instrument because it dropped down. He was so disappointed that he, his plan, his scheming to keep Kudiga in Samsara, it failed utterly, utterly, and he was ridiculed to the extent you can be ridiculed by a Buddha. The last one is Vakali. Vakali uh, was a special person, also a little elderly man, who had uh, one uh, funny feature which is known for, and this is when he saw the Buddha, then he, he, he was so impressed by his body and that he, he keeps staring at it. Uh, and that th this became a problem, not because he was sexually interested in, in the Buddha's body, uh, but because he just found him so impressive. And uh, they also, they have these 32 marks of a great man uh, and 80 minor marks. So they are impressive, but that's no reason to uh, keep looking at them. Uh, as uh, the Buddha said to him, the sight of my full body is useless. He who sees me, he also sees the Dhamma. Yuku Dhammam Pasati, so Mam Pasati. So Mam Pasati, so Dhammam Pasati. So since his, his body is Dhamma become, he's become Dhamma. Those who see him, they see also the Dhamma. Those who see the Dhamma, see also see, also see him. But Vakali, he just uh, keeps staring at, at, uh, at this body. Uh, however, in the end, the Buddha used a trick because he knew this attachment Vakali had to his own body uh, to actually uh, make him jump out from, from what Søren Kierkegaard calls uh, 
uh, 20,000 fathoms of the religious jump from where you go from the ethical stage to the religious stage, a kind of satori, uh, which you will uh, you which you will hear about now. Bakali. Thus have I heard on one occasion the blessed one was dwelling in Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Now on that occasion, Venerable Vakali was dwelling in the potter's shed, sick, afflicted, gravely ill. Then the Venerable Vakali addressed his attendants. Come, friends, approach the blessed one, pay homage to him in my name with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the, Ven the Bhikkhu Vakali is sick, afflicted, gravely ill. He pays homage to the blessed one with his head at his feet. Then say, it will be good, Venerable Sir, if the Blessed One will approach the Venerable Vakali out of compassion. Yes, friend, those bhikkhus replied, and they approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and delivered their message. The Blessed One consented by silence. You see all they agree? They agree by silence. Then the Blessed One, dressed and taking bowl and robe, approached the Venerable Vakali. The Venerable Vakali said, uh, the Blessed One coming in the distance and stood on his bed. Then the Blessed One said to him, Enough, Vakari. Do not stir on your bed. There are seats ready. I'll sit down there. He tries to move on his bed to get him to si sit on the bed. Then the Blessed One sat down and on the appointed seat and said to Venerable Vakari, I hope you are bearing up, Vakari. I hope you are getting better. I hope that your painful feelings are not subsiding and not increasing and their subsiding, not their increase, is to be discerned. Venerable Sir Vakali responds, I'm not bearing up, I'm not getting better. Strong, painful feelings are increasing in me, not subsiding, and their increase, not their subsiding, is to be discerned. I hope then, Vakali, that you are not troubled by remorse and regret. Indeed, Venerable Sir, I have quite a lot of remorse and regret. Quite a lot of remorse and regret. I hope, Vakali, that you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard of sila, of virtue, of morality. I have nothing, Venerable Sir, for which to reproach myself in regard to virtue. Then, Venerable Vakali, if you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard to morality and pure virtue, then why are you troubled by remorse and regret? For a long time, Venerable Sir, Vakali answers, I wanted to come to see the Blessed One, but I haven't been fit enough to do so. Enough, Vakali. Why do you want to see this full body? One who sees the Dhamma, one who sees is one who sees me. One who sees me is one who sees the Dhamma. For in seeing the Dhamma, Vakali, one sees me, and in seeing me, one sees the Dhamma. What do you think, Vakali? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent. Sir. Therefore, seeing thus, he understand there's no more for this state of being. Then the Venerable Vak Blessed One, having given this exhortation to the Venerable Vakali, rose from his seat and departed for Walsh's Peak. Then, not long after the Blessed One had left, the Venerable Vakali addressed his attendant thus Come, lift me up on his bed and carry me to the black rod on the Isikili slope. How can one might, lead, might like me think of dying among the houses? He wants to go out of the city. Yes, friend, those Bhikkhu replied, and having lifted up the Venerable Kali on the bed, they carry him to the black rock on the Isigili slope. The Blessed One spent the rest of the day and night on the Mount Vulture Peak, as you see here. Small Bhavanakuti, small meditation hut. Then, when the night was well advanced, two devatas of stunning beauty approached the Blessed One illuminating the whole Mount Vulture Peak. Standing to one side, one Devata said to the Blessed One, to female divine beings, Venerable Sir, the Bhikkhu Vakali is intent on deliverance. The other Devata said, Surely, Venerable Sir, he will be liberated as one well liberated. This is what, what those Devatas said. Having said that, they paid homage to the Blessed One, and keeping him on their right, they disappeared right there. Then, when the night has passed, the Blessed One addressed the Bhikkhus us. 
Come, Bikus, approach the Bikku Vakali and say to him, Friend Vakali, listen to the world of the blessed one and to Devatas. Last night, friend, when the night was well passed, two Devatas of stunning beauty approached the blessed one, and one Devata said to the blessed one, Venerable sir, the Bikku Vakali is intent on deliverance. The other Devata said, Surely, Venerable sir, he will be liberated well. And the blessed one says to you, friend Vakali, do not be afraid. Vakali, do not be afraid. Your death, will, your death will not be a bad one. Your departure will not be a bad one. Yes, Venerable Sir, those people replied, and they approached the Venerable Vakali and said to him, friend Vakali, listen to the word of the blessed one and the two deities. Then the Venerable Vakali addressed his attendants. Come, friends, lower me from the bed. How can one like me think of listening to the Blessed One's teaching while sitting on a high seat? Yes, friend, the Bikus replied, and they lowered him, uh, Venerable Kali, from the bed down to the floor. Last night, friend, two deities of stunning beauty approached the Blessed One. One Devata said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the Bikku Vakali is intent on deliverance. The other Devata said, Surely, Venerable Sir, he will be liberated as one well liberated. And the Blessed One said to you, friend Vakali, do not be afraid, Vakali, do not be afraid, your death will not be a bad one, your departure will not be a bad one. Well then, friends, pay homage to the Blessed One with my name, with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the Viku Vakali is sick, afflicted, gravely ill. He pays homage to the Blessed One with his head at his feet, then say, form is impermanent. I have no perplexity about this, Venerable Sir. I do not doubt that whatever is impermanent is suffering. I do not doubt that in regard to what is impermanent and suffering and subject to change, I have no more desire, lust or affection. So also, feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Mental construction is impermanent. Consciousness itself is impermanent, not lasting. I have no perplexity about this, Venerable Sir. I do not doubt that whatever is impermanent is suffering. I do not doubt that in regard to what is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, I have no desire, no more lust, or any affection. Yes, friend, those bhikkhus replied, and then they departed. Then none long after the bhikkhus had left the venerable Vakali used a knife. Then those bhikkhus approached the blessed one and delivered their message. The Blessed One then addressed the Bikusos. Come, Bikus, let us go to the Black Rock on Iskiri Slope, where the clansman Vakali has used a knife. Yes, Venerable Sir, those Bikus replied. Then the Blessed One, together with a number of Bikus, went to the Black Rock on the Iskiri Slope. There the Blessed One saw in the distance the Venerable Vakali lying on the bed with his shoulder turned right side. Now on that occasion, a cloud of smoke, a swirl of darkness, was moving to the east then to the west, then to the north, then to the south, upwards, downwards, and to the intermediate quarters. The Blessed One uh, addressed the Bikusos. Do you see that cloud of smoke, that swirl of darkness, moving to the east, west, north, south, upwards and downwards, and in between? Yes, Venerable Sir. That Bikus is Mara, the evil one, searching for the consciousness of the clansman Vakali, wondering where now has the consciousness of the clansman Vakali been established. However, Bikus, with consciousness unestablished, the clansman Vakali has attained final Nibbana. So, uh, Vakali, he uh, also went using the knife but as you see in his remarks, uh, prior to doing this, he is already enlightened. He has no doubt, he says. That's no ignorance. 
no attachment and no fear. And there's no aversion, no lust, no greed. For any form, any feeling, any perception, any mental construction or any kind of consciousness within this frame. And he don't consider it to be him, what he is. He has no lust for it, no regard for it, no affection for it. And therefore, there's no it's blameless for him at that point to use a knife. Why so? Because he doesn't get a new frame where the same impermanence rules the ways and where the suffering therefore consequently is imminent in this frame because of aging, sickness and death of any body, any form of body. Lastly, we go to uh, Venerable Sabadasa. This is from the Terigatta. Uh, Terigatta. Terigatta and Terigatta is the poems of the nuns and the monks that became enlightened and which they uh, set right after the enlightenment. They can be of various lines. Uh, they're very beautiful. They are translated uh, several times. Uh, and this is translated by Tani Sarabiko. This is this s number of sixes, uh, and some have only two, three, four, five, six, eleven, and so on. Sapadasa. He said like this, right after being enlightened. Twenty-five years since my going forth. He's been a monk for twenty-five years. And no peace of awareness. Not a finger snap worth of attainment. He has no results. He worked for it for 25 years, no result. Having gained no oneness of mind, I was wrecked with lust. He has sexu sexual fantasies. Wailing with my arms upheld, I ran amok from my dwelling. Oh, oh, shall I use the knife? What's the use of life to me? If I were to renounce the training, what sort of death would I have? So he's very, very frustrated. He worked for 25 years for enlightenment and he, not, he got nothing, no result. Should he go back to, to the lay life, he says. Then he's, 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 he's in despair with his arms up in the air. So taking a razor, knife we use for knife long old old-fashioned razor blade i sat down on the bed very sharp and there was the razor right in front of him placed ready to cut my own vein when apt attention arose in me the drawbacks appeared disenchantment stood at an even keel with that, in that very moment, my heart, my mind was released. See the Dhamma's true rightness. The three knowledges has been attained. The awakened one's bidding done. Then he put down the knife. So Sabadasa didn't do it. Uh, because it was not necessary for him to do it. Why not? Because he was not sick. He was not in pain. He was in mental pain because he, he, uh, he was not enlightened. Yes, so far, so good. But then he became enlightened. Then his mental pain, of course, disappeared. And, and then he had no physical pain. So the rest of his life, he would live at, in, in Nibbana, in a state of Nibbana called Sa Upatisesa. It means he has remnants of clinging from not in this particular state, but from uh, down the road, that is still effective, that is karma that has not been exhausted, that has not gone into zero. And that's why he still have a body, he still have a consciousness, and he still have mental construction and so on. But he doesn't form new karma from this moment of enlightenment until his death, where he attained final Nibbana, final Nibbana, Nibbana Anupatisesa, 
Nibbana or Nirvana without remnant or traces or effects of past clinging left. So much for the Buddha's stance on suicide, which in short can be said is folly because it doesn't lead to the end of suffering if you're not enlightened. Hang on in there and then deal with it, whatever there is to be dealt with, in a clever way. Suicide won't solve any question. You imagine born as an insect, reborn as an insect, eaten 10,000 times, that's also suffering. Reborn in hell immediately after the suicide. Uh, reborn as a hungry ghost for 10,000 uh, years or 10,000 million years, right after suicide. And that's not the end of suffering. That's an accentuation, a growth of suffering, right at the moment of the suicide. And that's the most, 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 most common situation. But the, in these three cases, I just been reading aloud for it. It was not the case. Their suicide was blameless, despite breaking their first precept. I hope you understand this important difference between the bulk of blameful suicides and the very few cases of blameless suicides. Thank you for your attention. Lastly, uh, I would like to say uh, thank you again to the donors, uh, in particular the regular donors who support this uh, Dhamma sharing every month, also to the occasional uh, donors. Uh, and if you want to supply food, and there's food needed actually for the next two weeks, then click the small eye up here, who over the small eye over here, then there will come down a link where you can click to give food via Kale Supermarket. Or watch the end of this uh, video. At the end of this video, there will come a a small sign up here, say give food, then click this link, then it will go to my website whatbuddhaset.net and there is a lowest link called online food dana to Kale Supermarket. And that's very, very welcome, very welcome. Remember also to click subscribe down there if you have not subscribed already. If you have an intention or rationale to hang on to this Dhamma teaching all the way home to Nibbana, the deathless element of lasting happiness, complete freedom from all suffering. and absolute peace. Of course, under such circumstances, in, high, in the highest happiness, there's no reason whatsoever to commit suicide for anybody, anywhere, at any time. Thank you for your attention. Namo, tasso, bakovato. Arahatto, Samma Sambuddhasa, worthy, honorable, and perfectly self enlightened was the blessed Buddha. And this ends Dhamma on air number 46, recorded on the 25th November 2016 on planet Earth on Knuckles Mountain with a rainstorm coming up. Lastly, have a nice day. Thank you. You heard Bhikkhu Samaita from the Cypress Hermitage on the Knuckles Mountain, Pamparella, Central Hill Country, Sri Lanka. Please subscribe to the Google group Buddha Direct and visit the website What Buddha said dot net. May all beings become thus happy thereby. Thank you. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato 
Samma Sambuddhasa. Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha.